Okay. So when when in, in congenital heart um, defect or congenital heart disease, we're going to look at the definition of the different types of uh, congenital uh, heart disease. We're going to look at the simple one first, and then we're going to go on to the more complex. And then there are some congenital heart disease that uh, is not defined. It's a combination of um, defects. But we, we look at the simple ones first and then the more complex. You need to put the, 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 these defects in a simplified fashion so you can always recall on your knowledge to, to, to assess them, okay? So we're not going to use any of the, 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 the complex classification. We're just going to do simple and complex. Um, we, we're going to see how these um, defects look in the two-dimensional images. Uh, we, color flow is going to help us quite a bit, especially if we're looking for abnormal flow and defects and stuff like that. And then continuous wave Doppler will allow us to, to do calculation. We can do shunt flow. We can do gradient and stuff like that. So. We usually use all modalities of uh, echo to uh, uh, help us uh, in congenital heart disease. And then you need to know some of the signs and symptoms that these patients uh, usually present with, because if uh, someone comes to you and they are you know, telling you that I'm short of breath when I, 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 I lie flat, I have to sit up, you know, you, you you know that they're probably in heart failure, and you know, if it's a if it's a young child, you know the things the the different stuff that you need to look for. So signs and symptoms are very important, um, and then you should uh, try and make a diagnosis. Um, it's always good to put things together, make a diagnosis. Um, Congenital heart disease, uh, what you're interested in is the echo features. So you need to have a, a, a concept in your, in, in your brain of what the different type of uh, congenital uh, defects look like. Um, all right, so you know that when we say congenital heart defect or congenital heart disease, we're talking about a defect in the structure of the heart and great vessels. So we lump defects in the great vessels uh, with uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, the, uh, these are the, the large blood vessels which uh, enter the or, or take take blood to the heart or take blood away from the heart. Um, This is a, a problem that it's fairly common. It occurs in about nine in a thousand births. So it's a fairly common um, problem. And if, you, if you're an echo tech, you're gonna see some aspect of congenital heart disease. So, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give, from time to time, I'm gonna give you some basic uh, echo features that will allow you to distinguish between the different types of congenital heart defects. So if you see a right, if you see a dilated right side, so if the right side is dilated, then you're either dealing with atrial septal defect or anomalous pulmonary venous return. Okay. So a VSD and PA, PDA do not give you a dilated right side. It does not cause dilated right side. So just a car, so if you're doing an echo is in, you know, in a, in a young person or any individual and you suspect congenital heart disease, if the right side is dilated, the only thing you, talk, you, you can think, in, think of is a atrial septal defect or anomalous pulmonary venous return. If the left side is dilated, then a VSD or a PDA. So 
you know, have those things at the back of your, your head so that, you know, you, you know, if you have a dilated right ventricle and right atrium, you don't, ser you're not searching for a, a VSD because it wouldn't give you that. Okay. Um, so again, congenital heart disease or defect is one of the leading cause of um, birth, de birth defect related death. So a lot of ladies, when they have spontaneous abortion, uh, it, a lot of those uh, fetuses have a lot of congenital uh, problems. That's why they abort, uh, they have the spontaneous abortion. And a majority is due to, to, to congenital heart defect, which prevents the fetus from developing. So uh, they usually have spontaneous abortion. Okay. Um, I am not gonna use this classification, okay? I, I, you know, I'm not going to use this classification. Um, so we're going to just go with simple and, and complex. So uh, septal defects will come under a simple congenital, uh, uh, simple congenital heart defect. And, you know, we have ventricular septal defect um, and atrial septal defect. Ventricular septal defect is very common, and we'll go into that in some details. Um, but we're not we're not going to use this classification at all. So atrial septal defect, which is one of the simple congenital heart defect, uh, as the name suggests, it's a it's a opening it's opening in the atrial septum. Um, so it's an opening in the interatrial septum. It occurs in about one in fifteen hundred live births. Uh, so when when we when we talk about a PFO, patent formen ovale. So if you remember the developing fetus um, in the atrium, the two the 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 lower portion of the at, the atrial septum and the upper portion. Um, there, at, at the time of birth, there is a potential closure uh, in the fetus. The, there, it's it's open and it's open in order for oxygenated blood to travel from the right atrium to the left atrium, and it, it, the the the, the, the forming ovale is a very important uh, feature in. The developing fetus. It's necessary. It's supposed to close at birth, and as soon as the baby uh, is delivered and take a deep breath, it it, it there is a it, it closes, but it's a, it's a physiologic closure where the two layers sort of come together. Okay, but it's not an atom. It's not an anatomical closure. So it can open, and we see PFO in about 10 to 20 percent of adults, especially if there is increased pressure on the right side, which opens that um, you know that that uh, defect. So so PFO is a type of ASD, okay, but it, 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 it's not an abnormal opening. It's a normal opening which is supposed to close, but it can open, and it, and it is open in about 10 to 20 percent of adults. Um, Atrioceptive defect accounts for about 30 to 40 percent of all congenital heart uh, defect in adults. So it's fairly common, and again, you have to know what the normal heart looks like. So this is the right side of the heart. You have the right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. And on the left side, you have the left atrium and top, the mitral valve, the left ventricle, and your atrial septum is right here, okay? So what I was trying to explain to you is that when you look at the upper portion of the, the atrial septum, it comes like this, it comes down, and the lower portion is, so I'm just drawing a very simplified 
thing. So the lower portion comes up. So they are not really in opposition. Well, they're not in opposition to each other. So in the developing fetus, you're going to have so blood will flow from the right atrium across this defect and into the left atrium. Okay, because so if this is the right atrium. Uh, and this is the left atrium. So remember, the oxygenated blood from the developing fetus comes from the placenta, from the mother. The, 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 the fetus, the lungs are not functional. So the oxygenated blood is coming from the placenta. And that oxygenated blood goes to the right atrium and it gets to the left atrium and the left ventricle by going through this PFO, which is a it, it's a it's an opening in the upper portion and the lower portion of the atrial septum. At birth, when the baby takes a deep breath, the, these layers are supposed to come together like this. Okay, so they they, they sort of come, you know, they, they sort of close, but it can open if the pressure on uh, on the right side is elevated for whatever reason. It can open. Okay, so, so when we talk about the atrial septal defect, so it's a defect in the atrial septum, okay? And, you know, we, it, it's different from a PFO, but, you know, we, we, we usually lump PFO in that category, okay? So the atrial septal defect is there. There are different types of atrial septal defect, and, you know, you need to pay special attention to that because um, you're, especially if you're doing, um, you know, if you're doing TEs, you have to know, you know, what your, your, your what type of uh, defect you're looking for. All right, so. All right, so again, there are different types of defect. You have the sinus venosus type of defect, which is in the upper portion of the uh, atrial septum. So they, okay, so it's the, um, the sinus venosus defect in the upper portion. And then in the uh, lower portion, we have the, this is also a sinus uh, venosus defect, but this has a special name and we will go, we'll, get into that um, and then three is your septum uh, your secundum defect okay this is the, is the secundum defect which is the most common type of atrial septal defect okay and then uh, four is uh, involved in the coronary sinus so the coronary sinus can be involved in the, the atrial septal defect. And then number five is the, 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 the primum defect, the ostium primum. So you have ostium secundum, which is the most common uh, ostium prime, primum, which is, it's an atrial septal defect, but it's a little bit different. And we'll explain to you the difference, okay? Um, this, the, the, the ostium primum defect is a very important type of uh, atrial septal defect, and you need to know what's the difference, you know, because it, it, it has clinical implications. And then again, in the upper atrial septum, we have the sinus venosus, and then you can have a lower one um, in the atrium. Okay, so again, we have the ostium secundum, the most common, the ostium primum is in the lowermost portion of the atrial septum, and the sinus venosus, which usually in the, the upper portion. Again, the ostium secundum is the most common, the ostium primum is, is in the lower portion of the atrial septum. The ostium primum defect is, a, is what we call the endocardial cushion uh, defect. It's a partial endocardial cushion, and when when I'm when we're discussing it a little bit more, I'll explain what that means to you. Okay, and then we have the sinus venosus. So the ostium secundum, which is in the vicinity of the the fossa ovalis, okay, 
um, close to the, the where you have the the the, the forming of valley. It it accounts it accounts for about six to ten percent of all congenital heart defects, and it is associated with mitral valve prolapse in about ten to twenty percent of cases. Um, there is a condition we call Luthenbacher syndrome, um, and those patients, in addition to uh, ostium secundum atrial septal defect, they have a mitral stenosis. And the importance of that is uh, because you have the atrial septal uh, defect and the mitral stenosis, blood cannot get out of the left atrium, so the blood builds up. There is increased left atrial pressure, so you you tend to get more left to right shunting. Okay, so the Lutenbacher syndrome. Okay, again, when you have atrial septal defect. If it is significant, you're going to get right heart volume overload. And that is what we use to judge when we should intervene in terms of surgical intervention. We, we use the, the pulmonary pressures. Uh, if the pulmonary pressures are going up, and we also use the, the, the size of the, the, the right heart. If the right heart is dilated, then that's time to intervene. It's time to, 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 to correct the defect. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll still talk about the shunt flow, pulmonary to systemic flow ratio, but it is not used um, for intervention. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, some in, most institutions don't use it. Okay, most institutions don't use the, the the shunt flow to 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 time intervention. They will do look at clinical features, the size of the right heart and the pulmonary pressures, and uh, if the patient is symptomatic. So if the patient is symptomatic, then you you should intervene. Okay. Patients with uh, atrial septal defect um, will get elevated pulmonary pressures. And that is one of the, the, the things that we, we want to prevent. We want to prevent the pulmonary pressures from going up because that is bad. Because if the pulmonary pressures continues to go up, then it becomes fixed and the patient will run into serious problems. So you will move from just a simple closure of the atrial septal defect to the patient may need a heart-lung transplant because if the pulmonary pressures become elevated and fixed, you cannot just close the defect at that point, okay? So when you have an atrial septal defect and you have a lot of blood flowing from the left heart to the right heart, you get increased blood flow. You get increased blood flow uh, through the pulmonary circuit, and that, and that can and will elevate the pulmonary pressures. So if you have it for a long period of time, the elevated pulmonary pressures will become fixed, very high and fixed, and you can get what we call the Eisenmenger complex, where you start having right to left shunting now because the pulmonary pressures are so high, okay? Um, you know, we, 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 can, we can do or we can use a trans thoracic echo with saline contrast and look at um, the defect. So we can do that. Um, um, but you can also use uh, your, your trans esophageal echo to look at it. Um, so patients, we routinely do a T in patients who have had a CVA, a stroke. Um, so we have a very low thre threshold to do transesophageal echo in patients who have a stroke, because you will find all sort of stuff, and you will find clots in the left atrial appendage, um, you know, among other things. 
um, so you can use both your transesophageal echo or um, your transthoracic echo with saline contrast. So I have a very low threshold for using uh, saline. Uh, so you inject the saline into one of the anticubitals. So again, do not use a vein in the hand. because You're not going to get a very good study. Use an anticubital vein, a large um, vein and um, you get rapid injection. So you, uh, first of all, you're gonna agitate the saline. So you should have a three-way stopcock. You put 10 cc's of uh, saline in one of the, uh, the, 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 the tube, and then about three cc's in the other, and you move it back and forth until you get bubbles, and then you rapidly inject the 10 cc's of agitated saline into the anticubital vein. It will go to the right side of the heart. And if there's a defect, it will travel to the left side, okay? Uh, you can also use color flow. Color flow Doppler will identify uh, uh, ostium secundum defect easily, okay? And as we said before, you can, estimate the magnitude of the shunt flow, that is how much blood is flowing across the defect by looking at the pulmonary to systemic flow ratio. So QPQS is the flow through the pulmonary circuit divided by the flow in the, um, or through the systemic circuit. Going back to basic hemodynamics, flow, so flow is equal to, uh, V, uh, TVI times the cross-sectional area. So we establish that flow is equal to uh, TVI times velocity integral times cross-sectional area. Again, when you simplify that, um, it's 0.785 times D squared times the, the TVI. So if we're talking about the flow across the left ventricular flow track, so when you simplify that formula, it's 0.785 times d squared. So d is the diameter of the LVOT. And you square that, and you're going to multiply that by the TVI of the LVOT. So that would be the systemic flow. If you want the, 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 the flow across the pulmonary circuit, it's the same formula, uh, 0.785 times d squared. But D is the diameter of the uh, pulmonary, uh, the, the right ventricle flow track, okay? The, that's the diameter of the right ventricle, right ventricle flow track. And then the, you do the TVI, uh, the pulmonary flow, okay? Um, it's it, it, concept, con, uh, conceptually, it's, it's, it's very good. Clinically, it's not so good. So what we, we, what we use clinically is, is the patient symptomatic, yes or no? Is the right side, is the right side uh, of the heart dilated, yes or no? And then the pulmonary pressure. So clinically, those are the things that we use to determine if we should intervene uh, surgically. Or, or, you know, we can close these things percutaneously now. We can go through the groin, uh, and go to the right side of the heart, and we can we we can occlude, uh, we can close the 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 defect, the ostium secundum defect. So bear that in mind. And echo is very is a very key uh, uh, part of that procedure. Now we come to the ostium primum defect. So we said before the ostium primum defect is an endocardial cushion. Uh, defect. And when we talk about endocardial cushion, um, so the developing heart developing in such a fashion that, you know, so very, very, very simplistically, that the heart develops uh, in, 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 uh, you know, all right, I'm just kidding. 
heart. So when the heart is developing, it developing, there is a structure that comes uh, down and there's a structure that goes up, uh, a structure that comes from uh, right to left and also from, from, from left to right. And all of these structures are supposed to meet to give a nice, uh, so they, they, they're supposed to meet like this. So, okay. So they're supposed to meet like this. So then this is the atrial septum right here up top. So that's the atrial septum. And then this is the ventricular septum below. So this is the AV plane, atrial ventricular plane, and you have the tricuspid valve over here. And then the mitral valve is over here. Okay. So this this is how the heart forms. So the structure at, at top comes down and it meets a structure coming up, okay, to form the atrial and ventricular sept, uh, septate. Um, and then you have the AV valves doing the same thing. But this development can have problems. You can have problems. So you can, so the, and we call this the endocardial cushion. So, so these structures, form the endocardial cushion. So you can have a partial uh, endocardial cushion defect where instead of the septum coming down, straight down to meet the AV plane, it can stop short. So if it stops short, you're gonna have, you know, something like that. And And then you 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 still have your so you have your atrial septum, but it stops short of coming down to the AV plane. So there's a defect. Um, the tricuspid valve is over here, the mitral valve. One other thing about endocardial cushion defect. Remember what we said. So this is also very important. When we looking at the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve will allow us to identify the right side of the heart because the tricuspid valve is usually located lower in the ventricle than the mitral valve. With patients with endocardial cushion defect, that's not that's not true. The AV valves are on the same plane. So if if you're doing a study and the AV valves look like they're on the same plane, you might be dealing with an endocardial cushion defect. Especially if the patient have the uh, osteum primum atrial septal defect, or if they have a VSD. Usually, when 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 patients have a, a osteum primum defect, they will also have a cleft mitral. They will have a problem with the mitral valve. They can have a cleft uh, uh, in the anterior mitral leaflet, and that usually goes together. Okay, so these are endocardial cushion defect uh, association. And the difference between your osteum primum defect and your osteum secundum defect, when we talk about antibiotic prophylaxis, so you know congenital heart disease uh, prone to developing uh, endocarditis, and we give them antibiotic prophylaxis. So we don't do that for osteum secundum atrial septal defect, but you have to do that for osteum primum defect, okay? These patients have to be given antibiotic prophylaxis. And remember we talk about percutaneous closure of the osteum secundum atrial septal defect. You cannot close osteum primum defect percutaneously. So those are the important difference, all right? so. Uh, so when we talk about the osteum primum uh, defect, the anterior and inferior aspect of the atrial septum didn't fuse. Uh, and they, they, the atrial ventricular septal, uh, so it's an atrial ventricular septal defect. Um, it accounts for about 15% of uh, atrial septal defect. Remember the most common type is your osteum secundum. The primum is just about 15%. And because of the, how it forms, 
uh, it is associated with a cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet, and the patient usually have mitral regurgitation. Okay, so usually when you're closing this defect, you have to uh, repair the mitral valve as well. And okay. Um, so it, it's important to all right so this is a uh, let's see if we can play that so this is a uh, it's not going to play but this 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 you can you if you look here, you see that the val these valves are on the same plane. There is no valve which is lower than the other. They're on the same plane. And then the defect is in the lowermost portion of the atrial septum. So this is an osteum primum defect. These, you cannot close this percutaneously. And these patients need antibiotic prophylaxis. OK? And you can see that there is flow across the defect. See? And if you look, there's uh, there's going to be mitral regurgitation because the, the cleft um, uh, anterior mitral leaflet. Okay, so osteum primum. So you have to know atrial septal defect code. You have to know it very well. Um, the the sinus venosa the sinus venosus defect, which is in the uppermost or the lowermost portion of the atrial septum, is just less than 5% uh, of uh, ASD. And um, it, it, it can involve or it can involve the, the venous outflow uh, of either the, the, the superior inferior vena cava. And there is something they call the scimitar uh, syn syndrome. Um, so the defect, because if it's eye up, it can involve the superior vena cava. If it's very low, it can involve the inferior vena cava. Okay. Um, this type of defect is associated with a uh, anomalous pulmonary venous return. So what what you usually have is uh, in, remember the pulmonary veins, which usually four, they drain into the left atrium with anomalous uh, uh, connection of the the right side of pulmonary veins. The, the pulmonary veins drain into the right atrium. Or the superior vena cava, so that's that that gonna bring a whole set of problems. So, um, so your sinus venosa defect, if you, if you, if it's identified, look for anomalous pulmonary uh, ve venous drainage. That is, look for abnormal pulmonary vein uh, drain drainage. Okay, it might not. It might be draining into the right atrium, superior vena cava or inferior vena cava. So once you identify your sinus venosus defect, you probably should start looking. All right. So again, it's in the you can get it in the very high in the atrium, uh, involving the superior vena cava or even the inferior vena cava. All right. So. We're we're gonna stop here um, to try and uh, get us uh, as as much information and go over the 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 information on uh, atrial septal defect because you're gonna see a, a lot of those cases and you should be familiar with um, you know what to look for. So remember, atrial septal defect. If, if it's clinically significant, you're going to get right-sided dilatation, not left-sided dilatation. Dilate your right atrium, dilate your right ventricle. You, you, you'll get increased pulmonary blood flow, and as a result, you get elevated pulmonary pressures. Uh, patient can become symptomatic. Um, so those are the things that we'll use to, to determine if uh, the patient need to be um, uh, treated, and we can do open surgical closure, or we can do percutaneous closure. Uh, percutaneous closure, 
only for ostium secundum defect though. And your ostium secundum defect don't need antibiotic prophylaxis. The ostium primum defect, which is a type of endocardial cushion defect, a partial endocardial cushion defect, those patients, if it needs closure, and they usually need closure uh, surgically, because you're, you're going to have a, a cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet, and you're going to have to repair that. So um, the sinus venosus defect is not very common, but it is associated with anomalous pulmonary venous return. So, you know, you, you, you should look for that because you're going to have increased blood flow in the right atrium. You're going to have uh, uh, increased uh, volume in the right atrium, right ventricle, increased pulmonary flow, and the patient will develop pulmonary hypertension. You want to get to these patients before the pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension becomes too high and fix, okay? Because then it becomes a very uh, major surgical uh, procedure.